Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Round Glass Review for the IRIX 11mm f4 ultra wide lens. Now, I use the Blackstone version of this lens, but in terms of image performance, the Firefly version will perform in the exact same way optically. This lens was designed by IRIX. Uh, we're going to call them the manufacturer as well, because I don't know their business arrangements well enough to know if they farm it out to another company or how that works. But at any rate, this lens is from IRIX. The name is the 11mm F4 Blackstone or Firefly. It was announced in March 2017. And insofar as I can tell, at the beginning of 2023 is still in production. Typical lens uses include all of the typical ultra, ultra wide lens uses, architecture, landscapes, and very wide field astrophotography, such as star trails. To give you the overall summary right now, so that you can go watch something else afterwards, this lens is so wide that it can be hard to use and placing the light in your scene, especially when you have the sun in your scene, will present one of possibly your greatest challenges to using this lens. You will have the best results with this lens if you keep it level because the keystoning effect of lens tilt is dramatic. And one other note, this lens is, as like I've said, optically the same as the Firefly, at least insofar as I know. So whichever version of this lens you have, this video's tips and information will generally apply because the differences between the Firefly and the Blackstone are pretty much just in terms of weight and uh, the way that the grip is designed. Those are the most important differences. So if you want to go up to the IRIX website and read along, you'll get all this information there as well. The focal length and AOV are 11 millimeters and 126 degrees on full frame, which is around 16 and a half and 105 degrees on APS-C. Aperture range is 4 through 22. The element and group count are 16 and 10. The design type, insofar as I can tell, is retrofocus. The filter size is 30 by 30 millimeter gels, which are inserted into the back of the lens behind the rear element. The closest focus point is 0.27 meters, which for those of us in the US is the diameter of 3.7 baseballs. It's manual focus only. The native mounts were Pentax K, Canon EF, and Nikon F. I use this lens in Pentax K on the K1, Sony A7S II, and Sony A7 IV. For those Sony bodies, I use the Monster K2E adapter, and I do not recommend that adapter for this lens as it does not communicate aperture correctly, nor does it reliably stop down the iris in time for exposures to be taken. That adapter does not work well with this lens. The dimensions are 118 by 103 millimeters on all mounts for both the Blackstone and Firefly versions. The weight of the Blackstone is 877, 868, and 838 grams for the EF, K, and F versions respectively, with the Firefly coming in 30 to 40 grams lighter depending on mount. I did not have the chance to use this lens for astrophotography before making this video, and I really do wish I had gotten the opportunity to do that. I do think that this lens would be quite dramatic for star trails with interesting foregrounds. This lens performs its best at around f8 in terms of sharpness. So to get ideal sharpness, you're going to have a very deep depth of field as well, around two feet to infinity if you set this lens to its hyperfocal distance at f8. Don't use this lens to achieve subject isolation. You're not going to do it. You are likely going to use this lens at its hyperfocal distance most of the time. So if you have the Blackstone version, the focus lock is a great tool. Maximize your depth of field, as that creates highly dynamic images. Get something in the foreground that's as close to your lens as possible, and then have a field depth that goes as far away as possible. That doesn't mean you need to have a background that's three miles away. 11 millimeters makes something that's a football field away look like you would have to walk for years to reach it. That depth of field and dramatic foreground background distance makes for incredible images in the right settings and with the right subjects. My next tip is hold this lens level. Also, keep the front element clean. This lens has such deep depth of focus that front element smudges will appear on your images. If you have water droplets on your lens from rain or a waterfall, those will also appear on your images. 
If possible, keep the sun to your side or shoot in spaces without shadows. If the sun is to your back, your shadow will appear in the frame. If the sun is to your front, it will almost certainly be in the frame and will either affect metering or ruin your skies. There are some workarounds for this, like having the sun behind an object, but in general, shooting with side light will make your life easier with this lens. Mind where your tripod legs are and also where your own legs are, as both can get into the frame very easily. And one last tip, if you are photographing in full sun, center-weighted metering can help reduce the effects of the sun in your frame. Now that is a lot of glass. This is a pretty advanced retrofocus design with a lot of corrective elements. In all, these pay off pretty well and deliver an image with excellent sharpness, especially given the price. Where this design fails is in its ability to prevent or control ghosting and flare, which are not class leading. Also, internal reflections cause a pattern within each scene. So as is going to be a theme in this video, the hardest challenge you're going to have with this lens is lighting placement because the lighting placement really amplifies or can completely mask all of the flaws that this lens has. This is going to be a highly truncated video section. I couldn't get any truly usable 4K footage with this lens because it doesn't play well with the monster adapter. So we're just going to cruise right through the two most important parts of this section. Breathing is considerable both from nearest to infinity as well as with short throw focusing on nearby subjects. AF has no effect on audio as this is a manual focus lens with a stationary and non-rotating front element and a stationary focus grip that is quite wide and easy to use. Sharpness is exceptional, especially given the price point. Is there some stretching in the corners? Of course, and that's a function of the focal length. However, it's completely workable, and if someone's criticizing the sharpness in your photograph's corners, well, congratulations, because you created an otherwise perfect photo with no other flaws. For build quality, Irix has excellent build quality, both in their Firefly and Blackstone lenses. The same holds true for their new single build type approach, by the way. This lens is no exception, and it handles beautifully and feels like it was built to quite tight tolerances. Contrast is exceptional, and this lens lends itself to great image contrast and wonderfully saturated colors. Light loss is quite dramatic on a white screen, but far less pronounced in real life. We'll scroll quickly through the white screen demo so that you can see that in real world use, light loss is pretty much a non-issue. Flare is, if a bright light is just off to the corner of the frame, quite pronounced. Flare is pretty much an image ruiner with this lens as well. Ghosting tends to travel with flare and is also visible when flare is not. Ghosting ranges from mild to severe based on where the light source is. Sometimes it creates a pleasing aspect in the image, sometimes not. Balance with cameras is dramatically front-weighted. This is a long and heavy lens and you will know it's there. The Irix 11mm f4 is something special, no doubt, and its specialness also makes it a significant challenge to use. The ultra-ultra-wide rectilinear field of view makes this an ideal architectural photographer's lens, and with a high megapixel DSLR, it's an ideal tool for that job. Like many specialist tools, it's not easy to master, and the times when it's truly useful, let alone ideal, are few except for specialist photographers. If you are a photographer of expansive landscape vistas or an architectural interiors photographer, this lens will be hard to beat. The Irix 11mm can make any interior look cavernous and do so without great distortion. Ultimately, though, this is not a lens for everyone, nor should it be in every case. This is a lens that takes some getting used to, and it takes some effort to use it well. The Irix 11mm, even for photographers familiar with wide-angle lenses, takes some practice, and that getting used to. It's fun, and it's amazing when it's used well, but it's not a lens that's going to be easy to master on the first outing. The hardest part about using this lens is simply 
understanding and getting used to how much of the scene it captures. Honestly, for most ultra-wide lens uses and for most ultra-wide lens enthusiasts or people interested in moving into this space for their first time, the Irix 15mm is a slightly better choice. The 15mm is substantially easier to use well and learn quickly, and it still delivers a very wide angle of view. For most people, between this lens and the 15mm, I would recommend the 15mm.